Hi, welcome back to The Basement. I'm Steve Lewis. Today we continue our deep dive into U.S. pop culture in the first three months of 1964, laying context and groundwork for our discussion of Shutdown Volume 2, which we'll get to in the next episode. Last time we talked about the music of early 1964. This time we'll talk about television, a little bit about the news, and of course what the Beach Boys were up to. But let's begin with movies. As 1964 began, popular films included Cary Grant and Audrey Hepburn in Charade, which would be number one for the entire month of January. The Prize, starring Paul Newman, Elkie Summer, and Edward G. Robinson, which will be number one for the first week of February 64. Tom Jones, starring Albert Finney. It'll be number one for the middle two weeks of February, and again for three more weeks in March and April. It'll also win Oscars for Best Picture of 1963 and Best Director for Tony Richardson at the Academy Awards ceremony held on April 13th. And it's a mad, 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 mad world. It had been number one for the last week of 1963 and will return to the number one spot three times over February, March, and April of 1964. Opening in wide release on January 22nd was American International Pictures' Comedy of Terrors. As we'll see, a big trend at this time was for movies to feature all-star casts. For their Richard Matheson scripted horror comedy, AIP assembled horror movie greats Vincent Price, Peter Lorre, Boris Karloff, and Basil Rathbone. On January 29th came Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. Stanley Kubrick's satiric nuclear Armageddon comedy starring Peter Sellers in a triple role along with George C. Scott and Sterling Hayden. The New York Times says it shows contempt for the whole military establishment, while the Washington Post calls it un-American. On February 12th came Seven Days in May, another film with an all-star cast sharing prominent billing. Seven Days in May was a political thriller starring Burt Lancaster, Kirk Douglas, Frederick March, and Ava Gardner. On February 19th, Dead Ringer. Following on from the success of Whatever Happened to Baby Jane in 1962 came a new horror movie starring Betty Davis, this time in a dual role as twin sisters. Along with Peter Sellers and Dr. Strangelove, you could say that actors in multiple roles was another movie trend of the time. Another dual role came a couple of weeks later, with Kissin' Cousins, released on March 6th, the first of three Elvis Presley movies in 1964. It was a pretty embarrassing hillbilly comedy with Elvis in a dual role. The move was almost certainly influenced by the massive popularity of the Beverly Hillbillies on TV. Released on March 11th was Beckett, a critically acclaimed historical drama starring Richard Burton and Peter O'Toole. Opening in general release on March 18th, was Blake Edwards' Pink Panther, starring David Niven and Peter Sellers. It'll be number one from April 29th to May 27th, and then again for a week beginning June 10th. A day later came the release of The World of Henry Orient, another Peter Sellers comedy. March 25th saw the release of Disney Pictures' The Misadventures of Merlin Jones, starring Tommy Kirk and Annette Funicello. Annette Funicello also opened the same day in American International Pictures' Muscle Beach Party. The gang from last year's AIP release Beach Party were back, including stars Frankie and Annette. As discussed in an earlier episode, by its timing, this movie ended up being one of the last glimpses of U.S. teen culture, as seen by AIP at least, before the influence of the Beatles. The film also featured songs written by Gary Usher, Roger Christian, and Brian Wilson. For contractual reasons, there was no soundtrack album, but some of those associated with the movie will release their own versions of the songs, as we'll see a little later on here and when we talk about the second quarter of 1964. On March 26th, we got The Fall of the Roman Empire, another historical epic in the vein of last year's Cleopatra, but with a more restrained budget. It promised not just one or two, but nine brilliant performances. The top build performances came from Sophia Loren, Stephen Boyd, Alec Guinness, and James Mason. And finally, opening in wide release on March 28th, The Incredible Mr. Limpet, a kid's movie starring Don Knotts, Barney Fife from The Andy Griffith Show, as a man who becomes a fish. It was a mix of live action and animation, with scenes above water generally being live action and the underwater scenes animated. Television was where it all seemed to be happening in those early months of 1964. 
On Saturday, January 4th, The Hollywood Palace premiered on ABC, reusing the theater and Saturday night time slot given to Jerry Lewis for a failed variety show in the fall of 63. It's another variety show, this time with a different host each week. It'll prove successful and run until 1970. On Wednesday, January 8th, President Johnson delivered his first State of the Union address. Johnson had only been president for six and a half weeks following the assassination of President Kennedy. In the televised address, he outlined the goals of his administration, including fighting racial discrimination, reducing taxes, balancing the federal budget, and launching a war on poverty. Following the address over on CBS came the Giant Jackrabbit episode of the Beverly Hillbillies, in which Granny mistakes an escaped kangaroo for a giant jackrabbit. It got huge ratings with over 60% of all TVs tuned in, an estimated 50 million viewers, making it at the time the most watched telecast ever. With President Johnson just having assumed office, his State of the Union address was a strong lead-in for the show, and certainly severe winter weather in much of the country kept people at home that night and contributed to the high ratings. There was also the feeling that, in the wake of the recent assassination of President Kennedy, people were hungry for this kind of silly, escapist entertainment. These last two factors were given more weight when the next week's episode, The Girl From Home, also drew huge numbers and became the fourth highest rated television program of all time. Both of these were just standard episodes of the series, not special episodes of any kind. Clearly, people were just in the mood for the Beverly Hillbillies, and other episodes around this time also drew extremely high ratings. If people were looking for silly, escapist entertainment, all three networks took note, as we'll see very clearly when we get to the fall 1964 television schedule in September. More huge TV ratings came to CBS on the night of Sunday, February 9th, when English rock and roll group The Beatles made their highly anticipated U.S. debut on The Ed Sullivan Show from New York. Their single, I Want to Hold Your Hand, was in its second week at number one on the charts. Kind of surprisingly, they opened not with a hit or another single, but with an album track, All My Lovin'. Showing their versatility, they continued with Till There Was You from Broadway's The Music Man and their prior single, She Loves You. They returned in the second half of the show, performing both sides of their new Capitol single, I Saw Her Standing There and I Want to Hold Your Hand. I was pretty young at the time, but I do remember the night. As a family with young kids, we always watched Disney on NBC on Sunday nights, but on that particular night, my dad said he wanted to switch away for just a minute to see something on the other channel. I remember laying with him and my brother on the living room floor, and he reached up and turned the channel over to CBS, and there was this wild scene of screaming and pandemonium and this crazy music, and mainly a bunch of guys with long hair. And we started screaming, they look like girls! They look like girls! My dad just roared with laughter. It was so wild and energetic and ridiculous that that was the only reaction he could muster. I recently asked my parents for their recollections. They remember it pretty much the same way, though my mom added that she thought Paul was the cute one, as she put it, along with 50 million other women. The broadcast was watched by a record-smashing estimated 73 million viewers, and there was no doubt that Beatlemania had well and truly arrived in America. From New York, the Beatles headed to Washington, D.C. for their first U.S. concert on Tuesday, February 11th. They had to travel by train since a blizzard had grounded the airlines. They went back to New York for two shows at Carnegie Hall on February 12th, then headed to Miami for some more press, some attempted R&R, and another Ed Sullivan appearance from the Deauville Hotel in Miami on Sunday, February 16th. By some estimates, that appearance drew even more viewers than the first appearance a week earlier. After a few more days in Miami, the Beatles returned to the UK on February 21st. In their February 24th, 1964 issue, Newsweek magazine reported, Musically, they are a near disaster. Guitars and drums slamming out a merciless beat that does away with secondary rhythms, harmony, and melody. Their lyrics, punctuated by nutty shouts of yeah, 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 are a catastrophe, a preposterous farrago of Valentine card sentiments. The odds are they will fade away, as most adults confidently predict. Newsweek did put them on the cover, though. You might as well use their images to sell a bunch of magazines while you're dismissing them. Naturally, the Beatles immediately came in for a lot of parody. And some of it, of course, 
was better than others. During their vacation time in Miami, the Beatles had visited the training camp of boxer Cassius Clay, who was preparing for his upcoming title bout with heavyweight champion Sonny Liston. Reportedly, the Beatles were quietly disappointed not to be visiting the champ instead of this brash, loudmouth challenger who everyone figured would soon be defeated and forgotten. The fight took place at Miami's convention hall on February 25th. Liston was an 8-1 to favorite going into the fight. Liston was so certain of victory that he barely trained for the fight and went into it with an injured left shoulder. After six intense rounds, Liston failed to answer the bell for round seven, and Clay became the heavyweight champion by a technical knockout. The fight was much anticipated and the results much debated. Years later, after he became Muhammad Ali, he said that this fight had been the toughest of his career. On January 30th, NASA had launched the unmanned Ranger 6 spacecraft equipped with six high-resolution telescopes television cameras to transmit detailed photographs of the surface of the moon. In another setback for the American space program, the cameras failed to operate and Ranger 6 crashed into the moon on February 2nd without providing any images. On January 15th, the Whiskey A Go Go, reputed to be the country's first discotheque, had opened on Sunset Strip in Los Angeles, becoming an immediate hit. Even the Beatles will visit the Whiskey A Go Go during their second visit to the U.S. in August. They're joined by Jane Mansfield, star of one of their favorite films, The Girl Can't Help It. The visit will end in a shambles when an exasperated George Harrison throws a glass of ice water at a photographer who refuses to leave them alone. As the year goes on, more discotheques will open around the country, making it something of a craze among young people. The Beach Boys missed the opening of the whiskey. The group, including Brian, were in the midst of their first tour of Australia and New Zealand, which ran from January 13th to February 1st. With them on the tour were Roy Orbison, Paul and Paula, and the Surfaris. Before the tour, they had already begun recording sessions for their next album, starting on New Year's Day with two songs, one of which will become the A-side of their next single, Fun, Fun, Fun. The single will be released on February 3rd, just as the band returned from Australia and four days before the Beatles arrive in America. Recording sessions for the album resume and conclude on February 20th. Brian is reportedly already feeling pressure from the Beatles' arrival on the scene and is disappointed that the album is rushed and not up to the new standards that he envisions for the group. Capitol is just happy to have new Beach Boys product to release and get the new album titled Shutdown Volume 2, out into stores 10 days later. Not that there's any shortage of new Brian Wilson product out there in the first quarter of 64. On January 6th, Jan and Dean's Drag City album had been released. It contains three songs co-written by Brian, the title track, Dead Man's Curve, and Surf Route 101. It also contains Jan and Dean's version of Little Deuce Coop. We already talked about the Drag City single hitting number 10 for two weeks in January. Drag City will hit number 22, making it Jan and Dean's highest charting album. A different version of Dead Man's Curve will be released by Jan and Dean as a single on February 17th. The B-side, The New Girl in School, is written by Jan Barry, Brian Wilson, and Roger Christian. More about that when we come to the second quarter. As mentioned in episode 117, Little Deuce Coop Side 1, Brian wrote and produced both sides of a single for the Survivors, Pamela Jean and After the Game, and he sang lead on the A-side. It had been released the same day as the Drag City album, January 6th. Also in that episode, we mentioned that Brian had produced a side for the Castells, co-written with Roger Christian, called I Do, released on March 9th. Also released around this time was another Brian Wilson production of another Wilson Christian composition, She Rides With Me, by former Mouseketeer and current star of the Donna Reed Show, Paul Peterson. In March, with no soundtrack album for AIP's Muscle Beach Party movie, some of the AIP stars begin releasing their own versions of the songs, written by Gary Usher, Roger Christian, and Brian Wilson. AIP singing starlet Donna Lauren is the first out of the gate with the single A-side, Muscle Bustle. Later in March, AIP and Disney star and another former Mouseketeer, Annette, will release her album Muscle Beach Party with the title track, Surfer's Holiday, and her version of Muscle Bustle, all written by Usher, Christian, and Wilson. The title track will also be released as a single. As discussed in episode 136, The Honeys Part 1, on February 17th, during the Shutdown Volume 2 sessions, Brian had found time to record a new single for The Honeys, producing both sides and writing the A-side, He's a Doll. It'll be released in April. 
In March, the Beach Boys recorded an appearance on the syndicated Steve Allen Show, performing Surfin' USA and Fun, Fun, Fun. It was broadcast on March 27th, and an appearance for American Bandstand, lip-syncing rather awkwardly without instruments, to Don't Worry Baby. It'll be broadcast on April 18th. Dick Clark interviews the group, asking them about the new album, their upcoming tour, and about their experiences in Australia. Mike says the Australian DJs aren't very hip, and Dennis says that when he was asked to surf for the press, he was surprised to find that the waves weren't too good. On March 14th, the group record a concert at NBC Studios in Burbank for a unique closed-circuit event. Before a live audience, the group performed the new single, Fun, 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 followed by Long Tall Texan, Little Deuce Coop, Surfer Girl, Monster Mash, Surfin' USA, Shut Down, In My Room, Papa Oo Mau Mau, and Hawaii. Through the magic of technology, the Beach Boys show and a separate show by Leslie Gore are broadcast to select theaters in the U.S. and Canada on the same bill with the Beatles taped concert from Washington, D.C. back on February 11th, allowing fans to see the Beatles in concert, if only on videotape, along with what will appear to be opening acts, Leslie Gore and the Beach Boys. What will they think of next? That brings us to the end of the first quarter of 1964, certainly a portentous quarter for U.S. pop culture. Next time, we will begin our discussion of the Beach Boys album released late in that quarter, Shut Down Volume 2. Meantime, I look forward to your comments as always. Please hit like and subscribe if you would, and we will see you next week. Have a good week. See you then. Bye. <laughs>